but that is not what we mean by unshakable faith. What we mean is faith that is of a quality that does not waver in the sight of any difficulty, danger, trouble, hardship, persecution. It is a faith that stays firm always. So let me ask you a question to start out this sermon. What does it take to shake your faith? A bad report from a doctor. Disparaging news from a family member. Zero in your bank account. Hmm? Finding out your child went back to drugs. Prolonged suffering of some kind in your household, in your family, in your body. Would that shake your faith? I want to talk to you today about building unshakable faith. Building the faith that stands the test of time. Building the faith in your heart that lets you be sustained through all things. Peace and trouble. Ease and hardship. Sunny days and storms. Your faith will be unshakable. I want you to open your Bible to Daniel chapter 5. And we're going to look at the life of Daniel. Now, well, really, just go to 6. I'm going to sum up chapter 5 for you. At the end of chapter 5, um, we know that that's the story, if you recall, of the handwriting on the wall. And the handwriting on the wall, the interpretation of that was 20, 20,000 divi uh, divided, which mean that uh, the, the kingdom was going to go to the Medes and the Persians. It says in verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. And so Daniel was there to interpret that vision and he, was, he stayed on. In fact, you may not know this, but Daniel served as an administrator under four different kings. So he was there and he was useful and he was acknowledged as a wise administrator by all of those because the Spirit of God was with him. So he was so efficient that all the other co-administrators, probably besides this, the other three Hebrew boys that were there, were all jealous of Daniel because he had such great success. And so they came up with a plan. And they said, if we're going to catch Daniel in something wrong, we're going to have to make it about his God, which which proves that not only was he effective, but he was honest and good. So, we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 6. So the presidents and satraps, and I'm, I'm, I'm reading for Revised Standard Version, so if your version is a little different, it's okay. You know, we're, none of the preachers are reading in Hebrew and Greek hardly, so we'll go with this translation. It's a good one. But if you're reading NIV or King James, that's fine too. So the presidents and satraps conspired and came to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the counselors, the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an interdict. That whoever prays to anyone, divine or human, for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions. Now, O king, establish the interdict and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. And therefore, King Darius signed the document. Now, of course, they come up with a pretty good plan. Because they appealed to the pride of the king. Oh, think about how that, that made him feel. Isn't that how temptation always is? Amen. You don't think about the consequences till later. Amen. They start to catch up with you. So, he signed it. And without going too far into the history, the Bible basically says, according to their traditions, the way they run their government, once the king signed it, it could not be undone. No going back. 
So it says, and then also in verse 10, look with me, although Daniel knew that the document had been signed. Now don't think that one of the head guys in the government didn't know what was going on. He knew. He knew that it had been signed. He knew what it contained. And he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room, open toward Jerusalem. Why did he pray toward Jerusalem? Because he was a Jew. And to get down on his knees three times a day to pray to his God and praise him just as he had done previously. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying and seeking mercy before his God. Then they approached the king and said, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the interdict you have signed, but he is saying his prayers three times a day. When the king heard the charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel, and until the sun went down, he made every effort to rescue him. The conspirators said to him, Know, O king, that this is a law of the Medes and Persians, that no ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. So this bothered the king greatly, but he was trapped. And don't you think that he knew at that point, I believe he did, that he had been tricked by these administrators, that they were trying to get rid of his right-hand man. So the king gave the command, backed into a corner, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. Think about that. Think about that, that even the king knows Daniel serves his God faithfully. And I believe that this king also knew this is part of the reason that this Daniel, this administrator, had the wisdom and knowledge that he had, because he had served his God faithfully. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signets of his Lord, so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No food was brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Now, he was troubled. He was troubled. This bothered him. He didn't want to lose Daniel. He depended on Daniel. He knew he had been tricked and trapped. And certainly if he didn't know it before now, he, he, he's realizing it at this moment. So what does he do? He worries all night. And then he goes to the lion's den. And I love this story as a child. I know you have heard it, many of you. But it says, then at the break of day, first thing in the morning, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions. And when he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? He wasn't saying that quiet, y'all. He was yelling it. Are you alive down there? Then Daniel said to the king, and what sweet words they must have been in the king's ear. O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. And so we see even in the midst of the lion's den, Daniel was preserved. And why was he preserved? I put this forth. Because he had unshakable faith in the God that he served. And it was not a chance that he didn't get uh, bit, uh, eaten and devoured it was the hand of the angel of God because we know the rest of the story is that when the king decided to deliver payback to the people who tricked him he took all those administrators and their families and threw them into the lion's den and the Bible tells us you read a few verses later that before they hit the ground they were lunch that's how the lion how ferocious the lions were Unshakable faith. Unshakable faith. What do we mean by unshakable faith? I tell you what we don't mean. We don't mean like the story of Peter when he gets out to walk on the water and he's doing fine 
And then he stops to look at all the wind and the waves around him. And what happens? That's, Lord, help me. I know, I don't know about you, but I've had to pray that myself. Lord, I'm sinking here. I thought I was going to do fine. I thought my faith was going to hold me up, but I'm having doubts. I'm starting to sink down. Help me, Lord. And thank the Lord he is merciful and good and he helps. But that is not what we mean by unshakable faith. What we mean is faith that is of a quality that does not waver in the sight of any difficulty, danger, trouble, hardship, persecution. It is a faith that stays firm always. It is steadfastly, consistently looking to the Lord and not to the troubles that beset us. It, however, dear saint of God, especially some of you like me of the Pentecostal persuasion, it is not a mystical force that protects you from all hardships in your life. Huh? I've heard it taught more than once that if you had enough faith, you wouldn't have any troubles. Well, let me tell you something, saying if you didn't have any troubles, you wouldn't need any faith. Faith in God. Faith in God. We don't have faith in faith either. Some people have faith in faith. Well, I just believe it. It will happen. If I just say it into the universe 77 times, it will come back to me. That's not God. Our faith is not in faith itself. Our faith is in the living God. Amen. Now, some of you say, well, I, I just don't have faith, Pastor. I've tried to have faith. I've tried to believe. I just don't have faith. Yes, you do. You have faith. God gave you faith. John 16, 33, I've told you these things that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. That's another way of saying have faith. I myself have overcome the world, and I'm going to be with you. I'm, I'm adding that little on to the end, but that's what he meant. He meant, I've overcome the world. You're going to have trouble in the world. I had trouble in the world, but I'm going to be with you. And remember, I overcome the world. Now, that's my translation of that. Amen. Amen. For by grace given to me, Romans 12 and 3, it says this, By grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So God has given each man a measure of faith. You all have some faith. We just got to make it grow. Amen. Amen. Faith is tested and it is grows and it is strengthened not during ease but during difficulty, during hard times, during troubles and persecutions and tests. That's when your faith is going to grow. That's when it's going to get firmer and stronger and greater. Now, you say, well, Pastor, what about moments of doubt? Raise your hand if you've ever had a moment of doubt. Raise your other hand if you've had three or four. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. But you have to realize moments of doubt for what they are. They are attacks from the devil. They are fiery darts, arrows sent to you to bring down to damage, to make you question your faith. Now, do you have to question God? Sure, you question God to learn. But when you know God is who he says he is, then you have to see that as the attack of the devil. Now, we accept these thoughts sometimes as from ourselves. But a lot of times they come in straight from the devil. There's a spiritual force, a powerful force of evil in the world. Satan and his minions and they come to whisper in our ears. And we all expect Satan to show up in smoke and, and flames. And, uh, and, but sometimes he's just the quiet whisper inside of your head that says things like, If God really loves you, how could he have let you walk through this? If God is moving in this area of your life, why don't we see any evidence yet? You say you serve God so faithfully. I see you leave your yard uh, twice, three times a week and go to church. Not during COVID though, right? Why hasn't God done this for you yet? Hmm? So what, what to do then? What to do then? What to do then? 
Well, you have a shield of faith for a reason. You can choose to push those things away. And say, I don't receive those things. What does the Bible say? To think upon and dwell upon. And you know what happens if you receive one of the fiery darts and you linger on and you think about it. What happens to your faith? It gets damaged. It goes down, doesn't it? But if you turn, like the Bible tells us in Philippians, to think on the things that are good report what are good, what God says about it, what God has already done in my life. If I begin to think about that, then what happens? My faith begins to rise. We can choose how we approach this dilemma. The dilemma of what we see versus what we believe. Because we say we believe and then we look at things and they don't add up. I believe in my heart God's moving in my child's life, but I don't see the evidence of it yet. I believe in my heart God is doing something in this area, but I don't see, I don't see it yet. But faith is not what we see. It is who we believe. Amen. 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 How is unshakable faith developed? How is it grown? Well, how did it grow for Daniel? Daniel, first of all, this is what happened. We know the prophet Jeremiah. This is a little history. Jeremiah uh, told the people judgment is coming, the ca Babylonian captivity is coming. Uh, Isaiah talked about, um, uh, about some of the things that would happen after they were uh, captive. But Daniel was alive when it happened. And so Daniel was one, and the Babylonians had a history of this. They would take some of the finest families or the, the young men like they did with Daniel and, and the three Hebrew boys, and they would take them and they would train them to be administrators in their kingdom. They would learn the language. They would learn the way they, they did things. And so Daniel learned at his parents' knees what the Bible taught. We know this why. We know it because we see he knew the di dietary laws from Daniel chapter 1. We'll get into that in a minute. But also he knew, he knew the prophecies of Jeremiah. How do we know he knew the prophecies of Jeremiah? If you look, uh, Daniel 9 and 10, you see that in Chapter 10, he was grieved in his heart because he knew and understood from the prophecies of Jeremiah that the 70 years, there was two prophecies, 70, uh, 70 years and, and 70 weeks. Um, or I might have got those tossed turvy. But he knew that the Babylonian captivity was to come to an end. And when it didn't come to an end, when he thought it should, what did he do? He began to fast 21 days. And that's where we get the Daniel fast from when he seeks the Lord and finds out why hasn't this happened yet. So... He, he knew the scriptures from his parents. He knew from Jeremiah and he continued to seek the Lord. He had faith, number one, from what God had already said to his people. And to us, that is the Bible. Faith cometh from hearing the word of God. If you're going to have to have faith in this God, this God of the Bible, you're going to have to know what the Bible says. He gave it to you for a reason. Can you think of God of heaven who created everything on this planet? <clears throat> everything on this planet has a reason and a purpose in it. Amen. He didn't give you the 66 books of the Bible just to sit on your shelf. Huh? To put on top of your dashboard in case you get in a car accident. No, that's not what the Bible is for. The Bible is to take, to learn to see who God is. That's what the Bible is for. And so that's what we should do if we're going to develop unshakable faith. But not only do we have the Bible, the Word of God, we have the personal experiences in our own life that we can look back and say, I trusted God and God delivered me. Can anybody in here say, I trusted the Lord and I've seen His hand move in my life? Can you say it? Daniel 1, 8 and 9 tells the story. Daniel says he resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine. So he asked the palace. That's when they, when they just got there, okay? He asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself from the food from the king's table. So God allowed Daniel to receive favor and compassion from the palace master. And what happened? What happened was Daniel made a deal with the palace master. He said, listen, you let me eat the clean foods, the foods I'm allowed to eat, me and the three 
my three Hebrew brothers, and you test us and see at the end of it if we are not healthier than the other people that you have in our position, getting trained to be administrators. See, if we're not healthier than them, what happened? Y'all know the story. When they got tested, they were better healthy than the people who ate from the king's table because why? Daniel knew what God expected of the Jews. He knew that the law, the dietary law, and he intended to honor God by sticking to it. Hmm? And so I'm not telling you today you can't have bacon because we're on a different covenant. But that is the way that they practice their faith. And so what did he do? He trusted God and did what the Lord expected. You will never have unshakable faith in your life until you also develop consistent obedience to what God has already said. A lot of people want to say, I'm going to, my faith is growing, I'm having faith in God, but they're lying because they don't believe God enough to obey God. What they mean by having faith is, I'm going to have faith in God so I can get something out of God. But what faith is, is walking in obedience to the Lord. You want to know where your faith stops? I'll tell you where your faith stops. It stops at the same place where your obedience stopped. Amen. Faith requires consistent obedience. Now, I've experienced this in my own life. None of you have ever seen it after you knew the Lord, but I have. So I'm going to tell you what, what happens. What happens is you pray and you read the Bible. And then as you're walking with the Lord, the Lord convicts your heart about something. The Lord convicts your heart about how you treated somebody. The Lord uh, uh, convicts your heart about something you're doing to your body. Body. Uh, the Lord convicts you about a relationship that you have. That's not godly. God, God uh, convicts you about how you are not giving to the poor. God convicts you about something and then you have an option. Because that option comes from free will. And the free will says, I can obey and yield to this even though it's difficult. Or I can... Continue to ignore this and not do anything about it. Amen, amen. So, if we choose to ignore it, then we break our intimacy with the Lord. Does that mean the Lord doesn't still love us? Of course he still loves us. The Bible says he's married to the backslider. Can we repent of our sin? Yes, the Bible says, 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But let me tell you what, even though that is true, when you are living in consistent disobedience to the Lord, you break your intimacy with Him, and that causes your faith to drop. Now you can tell me, well, they shouldn't. God hasn't changed. Well, that's true. God hasn't changed. He changes not. But we change. And our faith changes. And our and let me tell you, some prayers are answered according to your faith. <gasps> How dare you tell us that? Jesus said the same thing. He said, this is going to be done to you because of your great faith. Because not only they asked, they asked believing. Anyway, what if Daniel had decided, listen, what if Daniel had decided that he wasn't going to obey the Lord? Is your faith wavering? Look at your pattern of obedience. I dare you. If your faith is wavering, make sure it's not because your obedience is not consistent. Because nothing else will fix it until you decide to obey God. That's it. Pastor Jean, a woman of great faith who's taught us faith, won't fix it for you. I can't fix it for you. Your brother, sister in the church who has powerful prayer and faith in God, they can't fix it for you. Your faith stop where your obedience stop. Listen, obedience, uh, walking by faith means if God says that I do it, I don't have to understand it. I just obey because I trust in the one who gave me the instructions. Kind of like little kids. You know, when you have little kids, you have di different ones, different kids are different. We have different measures of faith to start out with. But you know, somebody who has just a little mustard seed of faith can grow to a great tree of faith if they keep 
applying these principles. You put your kid on the counter, some of your kids, you say, jump, jump to daddy. Some of them would jump so fast, you think, oh my God, I almost dropped him. The other ones, you have to say, come on. You have to coax them a little bit more. We're like that in faith. Some of us jump quicker. Some of us take a little longer, and all of us take longer in things that we're unfamiliar with. But if we have that measure, we trust him as much as we can, and then we try to trust him more. And so that's what happens. Daniel would not compromise. In Daniel chapter 1, he, what did he do? He obeyed what God said. He trusted him, and God honored him. And as that went along, let me tell you something. Obedience is not enough either. You can know the word and obey the, the Lord, but obedience is not enough. You also need intimacy with God. Now, we touched on this in my last series at the last couple sermons about loyalty and intimacy. But you have to develop closeness, openness, oneness, following, seeking, following God, seeking Him, desiring Him, wanting to know Him, sacrificing yourself. To get to know him better. Sacrificing other things to get to know him better. What did Daniel do? Prayed three times a day. Opened the windows up. He didn't care who knew about it. All of your faith rests on an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It all leads to that. Without the relationship, it doesn't mean nothing. Listen, a part, there are people who know the word of God much better than me. Much better than you, most likely. Can know, front to cover, know the original languages, S search those documents out, and still don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and who He is, who He says He was. Huh? They still don't believe because the Word alone will not do it. Some people obey the, in general, the moral law of the Bible. Of course, we're seeing that less and less in this postmodern age. But they obey it, but they still don't know the God behind it. That's why a lot of good people can be in hell too because we ain't none as good as we think and we need the transformative power of the Holy Spirit making us regenerate. Visit our website at www.pathwaytolife.net or give us a call at 334-262-4569. Please give us the title of the sermon when ordering. If you enjoy watching our Pathway to Life broadcast, you can now watch us anytime on our YouTube channel at Bethel Pathway TV. Enjoy archived messages from Pastor Gene and Pastor Adam. Just hit the subscribe button and you'll be notified of our latest videos. Go to Bethel Pathway TV today. Thank you for watching Pathway to Life. If you're in the Montgomery Metro or River Region area, we invite you to join us at Bethel Pathway Church. Our service times are Sundays at 11 o'clock a.m. and 6 o'clock p.m. Visit our website at www.pathwaytolife.net. Come, you will be blessed.